You're listening to a podcast from Cancer.net. This cancer information website is produced by the American Society of Clinical Oncology, known as ASCO, the world's leading professional organization for doctors who care for people with cancer. The purpose of this podcast is to educate and to inform. This is not a substitute for professional medical care and is not intended for use in the diagnosis or treatment of individual conditions. Guests on this podcast express their own opinions, experience, and conclusions. The mention of any product, service, organization, activity, or therapy should not be construed as an ASCO endorsement. Cancer research discussed in this podcast is ongoing, so the data described here may change as research progresses. In this podcast, Cancer.net Associate Editor Dr. Michael Williams will discuss some of the new research in lymphoma that was presented at the 2018 American Society of Hematology Annual Meeting, held December 1st through 4th in San Diego, California. Dr. Williams is the Chief of the Hematology Oncology Division and Director of the Hematologic Malignancies Program at the UVA Cancer Center and Bird S. Lavelle, Professor of Medicine and Professor of Pathology at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. ASCO would like to thank Dr. Williams for discussing this topic. Hello, this is Michael Williams. I'm a professor at the University of Virginia Health System in Charlottesville, Virginia, and I'm reporting today on some exciting advances in lymphoma that were presented at the annual meeting of the American Society of Hematology, which was held in San Diego, California in early December 2018. Well, there were a number of areas of lymphoma that had important reports, and I'm going to just give you a small sampling of these today. We'll start with a new treatment option for patients with follicular lymphoma. Traditionally, this type of lymphoma, when it's symptomatic and needs therapy, the treatment of choice has been chemotherapy combined with a monoclonal antibody such as rituximab or obinutuzumab. But investigators in a multicenter trial decided to test whether you could use a chemotherapy-free treatment approach for patients like this uh, by using rituximab combined with lenalidomide, which is also known as Revlimid, as a substitute for chemotherapy. And this is based on the fact that Revlimid plus rituximab has synergistic activity in patients with relapsed disease. So maybe we could see acceptable high responses when it would be compared directly with rituximab plus chemotherapy. So the way the trial worked is this. Patients who needed therapy, who had advanced stage follicular lymphoma, they had never had any therapy before, were randomized to either the rituximab-lenalidomide combination or a rituximab-chemotherapy combination that could include the regimens CVP or cyclophosphamide, then Christine prednisone, the same combination given with donorubicin or the CHOP regimen, or rituximab combined with bendamustine. So over 1,000 patients were treated in this multinational study, and the goal of the treatment of the study was to prove that actually the Ritux lenalidomide was superior to the chemotherapy regimens. So the results showed not superiority, but comparability, the complete remission rate between rituximab len and Ritux chemotherapy were really identical, 48 and 53 percent. And the three-year likelihood that the patients were progression-free, so had had no recurrence of their disease was identical as well, 77 to 78 percent. There was no difference in survival, which was 94 percent at three years in both arms. The toxicities differed, however. There was more rash with the lenalidomide combination, whereas low blood counts and the need for growth factor support such as GCSF was greater with chemotherapy. It was also interesting that some of the traditional risk factors didn't seem to apply as much for lenalidomide. So what would be considered higher risk patients 
treated with chemotherapy seem to do somewhat better with a lenalidomide combination. The importance for a patient with untreated lymphoma who needs therapy is that a chemotherapy-free approach with rituximab plus lenalidomide can be considered equivalent to rituximab chemotherapy. It's worth discussing this with your oncologist when you're considering what treatment to use initially. The next subtype of lymphoma that I want to discuss is diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And there's two presentations that I'm going to summarize. One in patients with advanced stage disease, meaning stage three or four. This identifies patients who have disease both above and below the diaphragm to make it stage three or stage four means they've got bone marrow or other sites of involvement such as liver or bone. And the question being asked in this trial, uh, which was part of the international Goya trial, just a moment to explain. So the original Goya trial compared whether a newer form of anti-CD20 monoclonal, namely obinutuzumab, which is also called Gaziva, how that would compare with the standard established monoclonal antibody rituximab. Or the findings of this study found that there was no benefit for the newer antibody. So rituximab and CHOP chemotherapy was equivalent obinutuzumab and CHOP chemotherapy in overall outcomes. But there was an opportunity with this trial to answer a question that's been out there for many years, and that is, how many cycles of treatment does one need? The investigators took advantage of this large study which included 712 patients who were randomized to rituximab plus CHOP. Just over 500 of them received six cycles, and the remaining 186 received eight cycles. Even the patients who got six cycles of CHOP chemotherapy also got an additional two doses of rituximab. The immunotherapy monoclonal antibody was equivalent between the two arms. And the results of this showed that there was really no difference at all with a follow-up of about three years. Response rates were equivalent. There was no difference in patients staying in remission. It didn't matter if in terms of survival, which was excellent in both arms. There was, however, more toxicity in patients who received eight cycles, including cardiac problems, infections, etc. These results showed that I think we can finally put to rest the use of eight cycles of rituximab CHOP chemotherapy for advanced stage large cell lymphoma. It's been an unknown entity because we've never had a direct comparison of these. So we can now say that six cycles plus the additional two doses of rituximab is a standard for advanced stage diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Now, what about patients who have limited stage, so stage one or two diffuse large cell lymphoma? Uh, that means just a single lymph node area is involved or two adjacent lymph node areas. In the past, these were treated either with six cycles of rituximab CHOP or sometimes cycles of R-CHOP plus local radiation therapy. And in this study, which took a long time to complete, it began in 2005, but it enrolled 592 patients who were then randomized to either four cycles or six cycles of treatment. Radiation therapy was not planned for any of these patients except for very specific locations of involvement such as testicular DLBCL where radiation therapy is a standard. The take-home message after over five years of follow-up for patients on this study showed that there were four versus six were identical. So 89% of patients were still in remission at three years after completing treatment, and the overall survival was really impressive, 98 to 99% in the two arms. So there was no benefit with limited stage favorable disease. Now, who are these patients? Younger than age 60, stage one or two disease, and normal LDH. They did not have bulky disease, meaning there was no nodal mass more than seven and a half centimeters. So if you fit those criteria, then you can benefit from a de-escalation of treatment and be spared the additional two cycles of our CHOP. 
Now, sticking with the topic of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, a challenging problem in our field is for patients who relapse after their initial therapy or in some cases fail to respond to a treatment like rituximab CHOP or an equivalent immunochemotherapy regimen. And a very exciting advance in the field over the past few years has been the development of chimeric antigen receptor T-cells or CAR-Ts. Traditionally, what we've done with patients who relapse or have resistant diffuse large cell lymphoma is to give them a second-line high-dose chemotherapy regimen, and if they showed a good response to that, they could then go to a dose-intensive treatment with follow-up consolidation by autologous stem cell transplantation. And with that, you can cure overall about 40% or so of patients. The CAR T-cell approach takes a very novel immunotherapy effort, and that is that a patient's own T-cells are removed from the peripheral blood, and then in the laboratory, they're modified and reprogrammed so they can attack patients' diffuse large B-cell lymphoma cells that are resistant to chemotherapy. So there were two important follow-up studies. Each of them involved one of the agents, the CAR T-cell products, that are approved by the Food and Drug Administration for patients with relapsed or refractory diffuse large cell lymphoma. The first used the CAR T known as Axacabdigene sillolusal. It's a quite a complex name, but it goes by the abbreviation of Axacel, or the trade name is Yescarta. So in this study, the investigators wanted to show that this is a, a treatment that can be extended to many centers with the product, the CAR-T, being made in a central facility by the pharmaceutical company. So it was a retrospective study of 295 patients at 17 international centers, a lot of patients across a broad spectrum of sites in North America and Europe. Virtually all of the patients were able to develop a and obtain a CAR-T product. It included patients with some of the higher risk forms, the LBCL, such as double and triple hit lymphoma, About 3% of patients died during the treatment, although only 1% of these were felt to be related to the treatment itself. The response rates were quite good with about 80% of people responding. The complete remission rate at 30 days after the CAR-T infusion was 47%. So it proved that you can use this centrally manufactured uh, product. So the patient's T-cells are collected at the local center. They're shipped to the manufacturing facility. The CAR-Ts are generated, sent back to the home institution, and then infused. And I'll say a word in a moment after I introduce the next paper to explain some of the side effects of this treatment. So the second study was also presented at the ASH meeting and published simultaneously in the New England Journal of Medicine in early December 2018. So this used the the second FDA-approved CAR-T known as Tizagen Leclusal or Chemriya. In this study, there were 93 patients who were able to receive a CAR T-cell infusion. 40% of them achieved a complete remission, and another 12% had a partial response. And at a year after their documented response, two-thirds of these patients were maintaining the response, including 79% of those who achieved a complete remission. So this trial again confirmed across multiple centers that CAR T-cells can be an effective therapy. The side effects of both of these drugs can include something called cytokine release syndrome, where the immunologic effects essentially release cytokines into the blood that can mediate capillary leak, respiratory troubles, and low blood pressures that can, in some cases, require intensive care unit support. This can be managed by other mediators that tamp down the uh, cytokine effect, such as an interleukin-6 antagonist. The other toxicity, which is less well understood and problematic, can be uh, neurologic effects, which can include confusion, speech alterations, and even coma. But again, approaches and treatments to identify and manage this are being 
developed. So CAR T's have become established. They're available at a number of centers, but it's important to consider this as a treatment option in the setting of relapsed or refractory diffuse large cell lymphoma. The long-term curability is still unknown, although it's encouraging that patients with very resistant disease who get a good response can maintain that response out to a year and more. We're going to be very interested to see how the longer-term follow-up comes together. The final topic I wanted to mention today is in Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia. So this is a unique form of indolent B-cell lymphoma where the lymphoma cells release a monoclonal immunoglobulin into the blood known as IgM. IgM is a very large antibody and because of that, when the levels are very high, patients can have problems with high viscosity or thickening of the blood, which can cause confusion, vision changes, sometimes respiratory problems. And these patients also can become anemic or develop enlarged lymph nodes or enlarged spleen. So one of the standard treatments for this disease is, again, the immunotherapy monoclonal antibody rituximab. But the responses are typically incomplete and somewhat short-lived. So it was exciting a couple of years ago when the targeted tyrosine kinase inhibitor ibrutinib, which targets the brutin tyrosine kinase in malignant B cells. This is an agent that's approved in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, certain lymphomas such as mantle cell, marginal zone, as well as lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma or Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia. So here's the study. Investigators had shown that if you combine rituximab with ibrutinib, that the response rates were improved as compared with rituximab by itself. And in a follow-up study that looked at this over a longer period of time, these benefits of the combined therapy were confirmed. These were included patients without prior treatment or with prior treatment with either chemotherapy or rituximab. And there was a confirmed benefit for the abrutinib-rituximab combination in patients whether they had had treatment before or not, and regardless of certain genetic markers that we use to assess risk in Waldenstrom. It was also shown that because these treatments continue indefinitely as long as patients are responding and tolerating therapy, that the response rates improved over time. The side effects of treatment with ibrutinib are well known now. Uh, After several years of use across a variety of diseases, as mentioned, and include diarrhea, sometimes rash. You can see problems with easy bruising or bleeding, atrial fibrillation, sometimes skin rash or muscle and joint aches. But most patients are able to continue therapy and to benefit from it over an extended period of time. So the combination of ibrutinib plus rituximab was shown to add benefit compared with rituximab alone and again is a treatment approach an option that you could consider whether you have previously untreated or relapsed uh, Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia. So overall, it was a very exciting meeting. We've had practice-changing data presented. I've given you just a sampling of those. I think it's important for anyone dealing with lymphoma or related malignancy, such as CLL or multiple myeloma, to be very encouraged by the progress in the field, the opportunity to get much better responses with less toxicity and with minimal or no use of traditional chemotherapy. So we're pleased to be able to offer these treatment approaches for our patients. And I thank you for your taking part in the podcast and hope you found it useful. Thanks again. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Learn more about lymphoma at www.cancer.net. And if this podcast was useful, please take a minute to subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts or Google Play. Cancer.net is supported by ASCO's Conquer Cancer Foundation, which funds breakthrough research for every type of cancer, helping patients everywhere. To help fund Cancer.net and programs like it, donate at conquer.org support.